studies in conservation would be to basically restore an entire landscape or at the very least understand different landscape patterns like habitat fragmentation and the development of edge habitats and then maybe even the idea of like building a corridor to bridge different habitats that have been fragmented uh, and make them seem larger. So this shows you several different ecosystems that are interfacing with one another. And you'll notice that you have these edges, and edges are very interesting parts of a habitat, right? Because you can imagine an animal that lived in the interior of this forest might not really want to be too close to the edge and might not want to be out in the grassland. Something that's out in the grassland might not want to be too close to the forest. So really, the edges are important in and of themselves. Natural edges are one thing, but when people, for example, set up agricultural plots, a lot of times you end up with these very unnatural edges, and then that can create issues that you might not really think about unless you're focused on conservation, conservation of particular species. And this, of course, shows you a what? This is an example of a corridor, right? So you've built this huge super highway. There might be animals that can't cross over this highway, so they actually build these little corridors so that it makes it more like it's one large habitat rather than something that's highly fragmented and committed into two smaller ones, right? So that would be the construction of a corridor, like that would be a landscape ecology conservation approach, right? Okay, conservation is not cheap. There's limited resources. Obviously, it would be nice to conserve all species everywhere in the whole world. Wouldn't that be nice? We can save everything, but we can't really. So what we do is we try to target resources where they'll be most, we get the most bang for your buck. And part of the way this is done is through this identification of what we call biodiversity hotspots. So you'll notice they show some terrestrial ones here in this orange color and green ones with the little blue triangles. You'll notice a lot of them are in the tropics. What, what do you think makes a good hot spot when you identify one? How about a place where there's lots of species? You tend to pick a place that has a lot of biodiversity. And you also pick a place, typically, where that biodiversity is threatened in one way or another. So you're looking for lots of biodiversity and then threats to that biodiversity and that would sort of allow you to identify these places where you really want to target conservation efforts. <clears throat> One way to conserve is to set up nature preserves or nature reserves, basically places where you say there's not going to be any hunting, there's not going to be any construction, there's not going to be anything that would threaten the species in this particular area. We're going to make a preserve or a reserve, a place where the species are going to be protected and not driven towards potential extinction through human activity. There's a lot of things that go into thinking about this. So you can imagine if you're going to set up a preserve, I want to make a preserve for a species, and I want to protect it for a whole bunch of species that occupy some kind of a, a ecosystem. Obviously, bigger is better than smaller, right? Size matters. If I want to save grizzly bears, I'm not going to set aside a preserve as big as this room. They're all going to die, right? That's not going to work. I need something big. And for most species, bigger is always going to be better. How about here? If you can't do big, Right? Or let's assume you could do the same size, but you could do either four little ones or one big one. What would you say is better there? So they're actually the same size, same amount of area. But is it better if it's a bunch of little ones or one big one? One big one. Why would one big one be better than a bunch of little ones? Because some animals have like large ranges, right? They're not gonna be, you can't like take an animal and put it into this little thing here, right? You would have to kind of like try to hop hop, hop, or something like that, that's not going to work very well, right? So one large area is much better than a bunch of little areas. How about if you're forced to have a bunch of little, little areas, then what? Are they better if they're closer together or if they're further apart? Closer together, why would that be? Because if they're going to be forced to hop, they can hop a shorter distance rather than a longer distance, right? There's more possibility for migration between these four than between these four. How about here? If you're stuck with having three little ones, why would you maybe want to have them more in a cluster like this than in a line? Notice this one can go here or it can go here, right? How about this one? It can only go here. They're actually, each one is more close to the others than if they're in a line, right? How about here? Is it better if you have three that are in a line if you're forced to have this? Is it better to have them with a little bit of connection or completely separate? Better with little connections. Again, the idea being that individuals can migrate through these little corridors, these little connections that you've got between them. And as far as the shape even is important, you don't want something oblong, because notice oblong, these guys are not very far from the edge, whereas here, there's a lot of spaces where you can stay away from the edge. I would suspect that the perimeter here is greater than there, right? So you want to reduce those edges and have more center. 
have it done. So think about all these things that would go into play. It's not as simple as, oh, we're just going to like tell everybody not to hunt over here and let the animals go. You really want to think strategically about how you set up a national park or preserve or whatever kind of a, a place that you're going to put to try to conserve biological diversity. So this shows you grizzly bears in North America. Everywhere that's yellow is where they all used to be. Everywhere where it's green is where they are. <clears throat> they're not here very much anymore. And you see these little pockets of where they're green. There's not, you're, you're, you could potentially have a situation where you can't really support much in the way of population anymore. Focus right here on this little corner up there in Wyoming. So notice here, we've got Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton Park right up in this northwestern corner of Wyoming. And yet here, some biologists came in and they drew a red circle. How big an area you would need in order to support a minimal, minimum viable population of just 50 grizzly bears. Grizzly bears need a lot of room. So here you're thinking, wow, we've got all of Yellowstone National Park, Grand Teton National Park, they should be just happy as could be. These two together are not even enough to support a population of only 50. And if you want long-term survival, you really need a minimum viable population of something more on the order of 500. That would require having an area as big as inside of that dotted red line. Depending on what species you're focused on, you can't pick some very tiny little preserve and just throw a couple of them on there and expect that to work. So really, we don't have something here that really is approaching what we would need for the long-term survival of grizzly bears in, in North America. Um, Costa Rica is a tiny country. I mentioned Costa Rica before. Um, Costa Rica is, to me, a prime example of a developing country that's figured out how to use its natural resources in a sustainable way. Most developing countries go in and just cut everything down and sell everything away. Costa Rica has realized by conserving and preserving their biological diversity that they can actually make lots of money doing it. Uh, when I went there, I stayed at a little it's a biological field station that's outside of the capital city, and it's called Envio, and they have a whole bunch of different biologists that come down and catalog the plants fungi and the animals that they find in the forest. And as they're describing new species, there's a major pharmaceutical company that's next door that actually starts extracting alkaloids and looking for medicinal properties in different species that are being discovered right out of the rainforest. Costa Rica has phenomenal ecotours where you go there and see little dendro babies, little blue jeans frogs. It looks like we're little blue jeans, right? <laughs> and you can go on these wonderful eco talks eco wants and, and there's just a tremendous emphasis in Costa Rica on really bringing people there to see the natural beauty that's there and conserving it, not destroying it. And where I lived in South America, Paraguay, they also have beautiful rainforests and stuff. Unfortunately, they're all being cut down because that's the sort of quick and dirty way to get a lot of money out of your natural resources. But Costa Rica has really figured out how to preserve and, and make that be profitable. You'll notice that all of these green, Costa Rica is such a tiny little country, and all of these green areas are all national parks. And not only they realize that there's these, there are these issues with having these little fragmented bits of park. And so you'll notice that they have these buffer zones, which offer minimal protection and corridors between some of the national parks. So that, I mean, really, when you look at the size of the country, it's like the whole thing's a national park almost. It's really a, a very um, different kind of an approach than most developing countries have. And then, of course, we have things like the Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary, which basically extends everything inside of that red line. So when you're down in the Florida Keys, you're inside of a marine sanctuary, the whole thing. And again, you wouldn't really want to have a sanctuary that's just like this, 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 right? You want something that's all connected. The larger the area and the more connected it is, the better it's going to be at, at being a, a valuable conservation tool. OK, and to not leave on a bad note, this is a horrible mine in New Jersey. This is the same exact place after they've gone in and restored it. So there actually are ways to go in, and mining is just like about one of the most destructive things you can possibly do to a place, and yet using re restoration ecology approaches, there actually are ways to reclaim lands that have been really destroyed through non-sustainable practices. Okay, so an extinction vortex, you remember that from last time? I'm not sure I can guide you to the answer without telling you the answer. That's brilliant. Yeah. Reclaiming the land? Come on. Reclaiming the land, it sounds yeah, like a, it sounds like a mosaic commercial. They could try, but I don't necessarily think that like all those lost eight lines, they can well, reclaim the land. You know? Yeah, I know. Yeah, you have to be a little careful who says they're doing it, right? Kind of like I love those Chevron commercials where they go, keep going. You know, like Chevron's vision in, in the world is to uh, somehow be environmentally sound, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if Mosaic is probably next. Is that what you want? Part of my natural there, there are ways to reclaim areas, right? So that you can, I don't, 
it, it's time consuming. I'm not suggesting that that was like, you know, that strip mine or whatever in New Jersey in 1974 and that was 1975 or something. I'm sure that was decades of reclamation and sort of get that. And there has to be a real concerted effort. I just think it's so but you can't restore it. Right? When, they, when they mine all that phosphate, they just like just destroy all like the peace river and everything. And they supposedly like reclaim it. They're really just like destroying it. It's horrible. But people do what they gotta do to make money. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's kind of what it all comes back to. Kind of, and that's why you know if you go on television and tell everybody how ecologically conscious you are, basically what you're trying to do is get business, right? And it's all it's all tied back to money. Is that everybody worth eating? Okay, so remember an extinction vortex happens in a small population, right? Because the population is small, you end up with a lot of inbreeding and drift, and then that makes the population even smaller. Most of you got that. Okay, how about a regional or landscape ecology approach to conservation might have been Transplanting individuals of a threatened species, creating habitat corridors, captive breeding programs, or all of those. Just talk about this a second. What would be a landscape ecology approach to conservation? Can't see it. Bigger. <laughs> Is that everybody now? Is everybody's number up there? Yeah? I think that's all we have about now. Okay, so a landscape approach would do what? Like a habitat corridor, right? A captive breeding program wouldn't involve altering a landscape, right? You'd have a small population and you'd basically be using strategies in order to reduce the effects of drift and inbreeding. And transplanting individuals, right, that would be kind of like the prairie chicken thing, where you take a group from one population and bring it in to increase the genetic diversity in another. It's a small population conservation approach, but it's not a landscape ecology approach. Do you all get that? Yeah. How about here? Ecosystems are fragile and composed of many interconnected elements such that altering any part of an ecosystem can have a cascade of effect on the entire system. Okay, so that's easy, right? <laughs> So we can go out here on a kind of We said that radial indeterminate cleavage is likely the ancestral cleavage pattern for all humanozoans, and spiral idiosyncratic cleavages represent determinate cleavages represent derived conditions for certain groups of humanozoans. Okay, then the key part of this question is it says use the phylogeny presented here. That's this picture, right? And your knowledge of the cleavage pattern for each group. In other words, what type of cleavage do you find in each one of these groups, right? In order to argue that radial cleavage, and I, see, I don't like the wording of this. I shouldn't have said is in fact. I should have said instead is likely. If I could rewrite that, I'd rewrite that. Is likely ancestral and spiral and idiosyncratic cleavage patterns are derived. So this is actually rather simple. Cnidarians have radial cleavage. Lophotrochozoans, at least some of them, the mollusk, annelids, and platycomans, have spiral cleavage. So you could almost, didn't on a lot of your exams, I wrote an R here, 
wrote an S here, even though there are lobotropic zones that have radial. So the bryozoans and rotifers and things like that have radial. But you can go ahead and write S here. Ectisozoa, all of them, the way that they're defined now, all the, even the tardrates and onycomplins and stuff, all have idiosyncratic. And deuterostomes, of course, you realize all have radial. So you would have something like R, S, I, R. Yeah? Based on that, and based only on that, the most parsimonious assumption would be that radial is the ancestral condition for everybody. Sponges kind of have radial too. Sponges definitely don't have to terminate. They, the problem is they don't have true tissue, so talking about cell fates being established early on is kind of nonsensical in the sponge. But if you were going to characterize the cleavage in a sponge, you'd characterize it as being radial. The, the question is basically asking you, what was this? Was this guy here, this common ancestor that these guys all share, was it R, was it S, or was it I? Well, if you say that it was R, then you only map R here, S here, and I here. That's three steps. If you said that this was S, then you have to mark R here, I here, and R here. That's four steps. That's less likely than three steps less parsimonious. Do you all remember this? How about if this was I? If this was I, then you have to mark R here, R here, and you have to mark S here. That's in four steps. So just following the rules of parsimony, because you have two radically unrelated lineages that are both R, the most parsimonious assumption, just based on this little tiny tree, is that R is actually the ancestral condition. That's what I wanted you to say. Some of you got all caught up in the actual biology of what it means to have determinate or indeterminate cleavage. But you'll notice the question says, use the phylogeny. I want you to use this tree in order to make the argument, not use some aspect of determinate or indeterminate cleavage, because I think that's very hard to do. Are the ectis zones the only ones that have idiosyncratic Okay, so in Campbell, Campbell actually says that ACIs, remember the little guys that were platy helmets, but they're now the sister group, presumably, to all the bilaterians, they're touted as having I would argue that can't be the same thing, probably, because they're not related to any of these ectisozoans. So it's another determinant cleavage type, but they're just... Remember, if you pick up Campbell's fifth edition, they're going to tell you that all of the ectisozoans there have spiral cleavage. That's what it says in Campbell's fifth edition. So this idea of having a different determinant cleavage type for ectisozoans is brand new, and they're calling it idiosyncratic. And I have a feeling what you see in ACLs, remember also tenophores. Tenophores. Biradio? Are bi have biradial symmetry, but they have a determinant type of cleavage that's not going to be idiosyncratic or spiral. There's a paper in the lab supplements, if you look at it, there's probably a dozen different types of determinant cleavage that have evolved across animals. Yeah? They're only acknowledging these two now, the spiral and idiosyncratic. But that's why I'm trying to make it simpler for you. And like I'm telling you, there are some members of the Lopatrophozoa that have radial. Presumably, they just don't have the derived condition. They have the ancestral condition. But the three major Lopatrophozoa and phyla that you learned, right, Bloody helmets, mollusks, and amulets all have spiral. So I, I think instead what I would do is just put R, S, I, and R, and then just argue that because the R occurs in two unrelated lineages, if you assume it's ancestral, you get a shorter tree. Right? Or, I mean, you, you have to make fewer evolutionary assumptions on this tree if R is ancestral. Otherwise, you're going to have to have more evolutionary assumptions if S or I is ancestral. That's all. In the question, it says to argue that radio cleavage Right. And, you, and your argument would be you have fewer steps on the tree, right? You have fewer evolutionary assumptions in the tree if R is ancestral. If S is ancestral or I is ancestral, you have to make more evolutionary assumptions. Because what does that mean? If R is not back here, then that means R had to evolve independently in Nigerian and Deuterium stones. But if you say that R is here, then there's no convergence at all, right? The R is just retained as the ancestral condition in these two, and S and I are each derived for local chromosomes and ectisozoans. There's no convergence. That's, that's an easier way to say it, maybe. If R is ancestral, there's no convergence in the tree. If R is not ancestral and S or I is ancestral, then you have to have convergence. Because you have R in two completely unrelated lineages. Yeah. So if you have R in two completely unrelated lineages, you have to assume it's convergent. Convergent events are going to add more steps to your tree. Yeah. No. Doesn't this sound like stuff I've been talking about since January? Or no? Mm -hmm. Not really. Yes. So that's kind of the 
Can you all write an answer for that? Basically, I would go ahead and label these as being either radial, because it says use your knowledge or something. Your knowledge is that cnidarians are radial, lophotrochozoans are spiral, ectisozoans are idiosyncratic, and deuterostomes are radial. That's your knowledge, right? So I'd go ahead and mark that on here, yeah? And then say, if radial is ancestral, that means that there's no convergence in this tree. Radial only has to map on here once. If radial is not ancestral, because it occurs in two unrelated lineages, you have to assume it's convergent and map it on the tree twice. That's going to make a longer, less parsimonious tree. So under the rules of parsimony, you would argue that that is a less likely scenario. Of course, it's possible, but it's less likely. That's why it shouldn't say, is in fact. It should say, is more likely to be ancestral or something. I, I, if I ever use this again, I'll reward that. I'm stuck with it for now. OK, everybody OK with that? Satisfied? Minimally satisfied? OK, want to ask me another one? Okay, so exam one, real exam one, yeah. number two, says, why does rejection of a null hypothesis usually require the application of a statistical test? Be sure that you show you understand what a null hypothesis is and how it's used in scientific investigations. So let's start out with what's a null hypothesis? Of no effect or no difference, right? And what does statistics do? What is the purpose of a statistical test? It basically enables you to take two numbers and do what? Reject the idea that they're the same number. That's what a statistical test does. In every statistical test, you take two numbers and you're rejecting the idea that they're the same number. You say that they're statistically different. So two numbers being the same number would, in essence, be a null hypothesis. It's a hypothesis of no difference. And what you attempt to do is you attempt to reject that null hypothesis. To, you attempt to demonstrate that statistically two numbers are actually different. Yeah. I wanted to know um, whether or not my toothpaste makes your teeth whiter, right? So the null hypothesis would be that the toothpaste has no, no effect. effect. So if I have some measurement of your teeth before and your teeth after, right, I'm going to get two numbers. Let's imagine I could measure whiteness somehow, right? So I have these two numbers. And what I want to do is I want to try to reject that idea that they're not different. So I would take those two numbers, apply a statistical test, and try to demonstrate that statistically those two numbers are different. If I can show that statistically they're different, then I would reject the null hypothesis, and that means that it doesn't have a wire, that it's actually different than they used to be. No? Yeah. So I'd start out that by telling me that a null hypothesis is a hypothesis of no difference or no effect. Nothing's going on. This is why Hardy Weinberg's law is a null model for evolution. It's a null hypothesis in essence, right? Because how many different ways could a population be in equilibrium or not be evolved? Only one. Only one, right? In which case P and Q are not changing as you go from one generation to the next. There's only one way to have it not different, right? There's lots of different ways that it could be different, right? There's lots of ways to be different. There's only one way to be the same. So that's why a, a null hypothesis is, is appealing, is because there's only one way that you can have no effect or not be different. There's potentially lots of different ways you can have an effect or be different, but there's only one way that you can be the same. So you state the hypothesis in the form of a null hypothesis, and then if there's numerical data, you attempt to take two values and statistically demonstrate that they're different. That gives you the ability to reject a null hypothesis based on a statistical argument. Either that or you fail to reject a null hypothesis based on a statistical argument, that you can't demonstrate that the two numbers are statistically different. Yeah. And notice in none of that did I use the word prove, right? We're not going to use that word. There's nothing proving here, right? I can't prove that your teeth are wider. What I can do is I can statistically reject the idea that your teeth aren't wider. That's what I can do. But I can't prove that your teeth are wider, right? Why? Because what does a statistical test do? Remember, you go in with an alpha. You go in with some predetermined percentage of which you're going to be comfortable making a mistake. Usually 5% is what's selected, right? So if you go in with an alpha of 5%, what that means is you're going to accept a 5% chance of making a type 1 error, of accidentally rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true, right? But you're always going to have to have some percentage 
of type one air that you're going to consider acceptable. You're never going to be able to drive that to zero percent, right? So there's always going to be a chance that you're rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true. That's why we're not going to say we reject the null hypothesis because it's false. We're going to say that statistically we have an argument to reject it. That's what it is. There's no such thing as scientifically proven, right? Have I convinced you all of this in my room today? Because there's nothing science, because I'm telling you you can't prove things in science, but you seriously can't prove things in science. The best you can do is make a statistical argument, right, for something. That the that either you have statistical evidence that the null hypothesis should not be rejected or that it should be rejected, but you can't prove anything. Okay. Yeah. I'll let her go first. Okay. <laughs> uh, exam two, question one. Okay, so real exam two, question one. So it says, mitochondria and chloroplasts are both thought to have arisen via endosymbiotic acquisition events. You all know what endosymbiosis is, right? Basically one cell engulfing another cell, right? Like through phagocytosis. However, there are several differences between the way in which eukaryotic mitochondria was acquired and the way in which the eukaryotic chloroplast was acquired. Discuss two of these differences, okay? I'll pick the ones that are easy. There's particularly, a, potentially several things you could put, right? Let's start with what was engulfed. So what was engulfed in the acquisition of a mitochondria? You had a little eukaryote and it engulfed a... Well, specifically, what kind of a prokaryote? It was an alpha purple proteobacterium, right? Well, if you put proteobacteria in, that would be fine. It's in the same general group of bacteria that includes things like E. coli. Yeah? Isn't there a specific I don't know if there's going to be like a specific genus species name, but it's an alpha purple proteobacterium. Proteobacteria is a, a, a category of bacteria that includes other things. And in the case of the original chloroplast acquisition, what's being engulfed? A prokaryote, but what kind of a pro prokaryote? Not a proteobacterium, but a cyanobacterium. Yeah, that would be that would be photosynthetic. So that would be one difference, right? In one case, you're engulfing an aerobic respiring proteobacterium. In the other case, you're engulfing a photosynthetic cyanobacterium. You could argue that's a difference. Okay? The other main difference, and the one that I really want you to include, is that mitochondria are currently thought to have been acquired only a single time. All mitochondria in all eukaryotes are thought to be descended from a single acquisition event. That's definitely not true for chloroplasts, right? Chloroplasts were acquired in multiple different convergent endosymbiotic acquisition events, some primary, some secondary, some tertiary, all different kinds of acquisition events that led to all the different types of chloroplasts that we find in scriminal cows and chlorarachnophytes and red algae, green algae, diatoms. I mean, all the different photosynthetic organisms, they have chloroplasts that were all derived from a lot of different acquisition events, not just one. But mitochondria is presumably a single event, and all modern eukaryotes have mitochondria that are the result of that single acquisition event. Anything else you guys want to there? That to me would be two. I sort of stick with those two unless you have something else you really want to put there. There are other things you can put, right? But I think those are the easiest. Are you satisfied with that? No. Okay. Next. Oh, number two on that same one. Number two on the same one. So prokaryotes occupy important ecological and symbiotic niches that directly or indirectly affect the survival of other non-prokaryotic organisms. Give two specific examples in way, in ways of ways in which prokaryotes impact the lives of eukaryotes. So, okay, so pick one. What 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 exactly do prokaryotes do that you could argue is an important ecological niche? Maybe we'll start. We'll do. How about one ecological, one symbiotic? There's potentially lots of things you could put, but let's let's do one. Ecological one. So, what is it that prokaryotes do? Huh? They say nitrogen. Yeah, nitrogen fixation. I think you could argue decomposition or something like that too. But nitrogen fixation is a really great one because fungi are, are important in decomposition too. Certainly, there there are ways in which um, fungi are able to decompose certain things that only fungi can do, and bacteria things that only bacteria can do. So you could argue that they have very important ecological niches for decomposition, I wouldn't fault you for that. But nitrogen fixation is unique to prokaryotes. There's no eukaryotes that can do it at all, right? And nitrogen fixation is essential for life. There's no way that life would exist without nitrogen fixation. So that's a critical, important one. Okay, how about a symbiotic niche? That's pretty easy, too. Okay. 
Okay, there's a lot of, so for example, it's actually prokaryotes that are in like the guts of termites and stuff that actually carry out the breakdown of lignin and wood and stuff like that. Termites themselves can't digest wood. They rely on bacteria to do that. So, and you of course have a whole intestinal fauna, uh, a whole bunch of different microbes that live inside of your gut, prokaryotes that live inside of your gut that aid with different aspects of digestion. There was somebody had something they were selling that was like stuff you could put on your teeth to actually restore the natural bacteria that are supposed to be on your teeth. It's supposed to prevent gum disease and all that kind of stuff. You have a whole host of, of different bacteria that live throughout your body that are really important in maintaining your health. Um, how about another type of symbiosis? Because this just says that impact the lives of eukaryotes. So what would be a slightly less benevolent type of symbiosis? I mean, there's a lot of bacteria that disease. cause disease. Yeah. I mean, so you could name a couple bacterial diseases or bacterial infections or something like that that would potentially be bad. <laughs> that would be like yeah. ergot. Ergot's a fungus. But, yeah. Um, I know when we did prokaryotes, I probably did put up a couple bacterial infections on plants. Th those are harder to come up with, though, than in people. But, you know, something like botulism, maybe, or something like that that would be caused by the bacteria. Okay. Next. Exam one question, please. Exam one question. So, real exam one question. The real one. So I presented a list of species concepts that are typically covered in a discussion of what is a species. The list included morphological, ecological, phylogenetic, and biological species concepts. I argued that it would be better to think of these as species recognition criteria, not species concepts. Why? Okay. So if I was using a morphological species concept, that would mean that I would come in and tell you that you know these two birds are different species because one has uh, blue wings and the other one has turquoise wings or something. So I would say that because of the differences in feather color that they are two different species. That would be based on their morphology. Their ecology would be based on one lives high up in branches, one, one lives down low in branches, right? And so I would argue that they're two different species because they occupy different parts of the tree. Uh, phylogenetic would mean that I did some kind of a little phylogenetic analysis. I basically got a family tree and one group of birds always came out over here and one group always came out over here. So I'd argue that Phylogenetically, they're two different groups, they're two different species. And biological would mean what? If I really had a, a, a biological way of identifying the two different species, that would mean that I had tried to breed them. And for some reason, there was a reason why they couldn't mate and produce fertile offspring, right? That they were intrinsically, reproductively incompatible with one another. So notice that, the, it, but then if I come back to this question of, well, how do I define a species? How do I tell you what makes a species a species? Are those two birds different species because they have different colored wings? Well, I mean, we have like different colored hair. Does that make us different species? There are morphological differences that you can see within a population, right? So how do you decide whether the morphological variation is variation that's indicative of two different species or whether it's just variation within a species? How do you know that? The answer is you don't in real life, right? How about phylogenetically? Remember, if you're in a tree, how do I decide whether you know this is one species and this is another, or maybe all of this is a species and this is a separate species? How do I know where to draw the line? Just because I can see clades, just because I can see families in there, doesn't mean that I know exactly where one species begins and another one ends. How about ecology? I mean, is there anything about them being higher up in the tree or lower down in the tree that tells me they're two different species? How would I know that? Maybe it's just one species that lives all over the place. How do you know that, right? So really, all of those are, is, is there, they don't get at the heart of what a species is. How do we define a species? What do we really think of as a species? It kind of ties more to that last one, which is what? We think of it as a group of individuals that are reproductively unified, right? A gene pool. A gene pool, in essence, is kind of what a species is. So why would we consider all humans to be a single species when we're all so variable? Because we're reproductively cohesive, right? All humans can mate with other humans where we represent one 
unified gene pool. Same thing for dogs. I mean, look at how radically different dogs are based on their morphology, their ecology, their behavior. But we would consider them, most people would consider them to be a single species. Why? Because they're all interfered with one another. And dogs represent a single cohesive gene pool. So it's tied really to that last one, this idea of reproductive cohesion and reproductive isolation from other species, right? You don't consider a dog and a cat to be the same species because the gene pools don't mix, right? You can't breed dogs and cats together and get something in the middle and get dog genes into a cat and cat genes into a dog. The gene pools are separate because they're reproductively isolated from one another. So what I would argue is, yeah, at the same time, okay, so can you all tell a dog from a cat? Yeah. Well, how do you do that? You sit down and try to get them to breed? You laugh, but no. How do you tell a dog from a cat? Cats have pointy ears, right? Dogs have floppy ears, and dogs bark, and cats meow, and right? What are you using? You're using morphological recognition, right? But a dog's not a dog because it barks and a cat meows, right? A dog and a cat are separate species because they can't interbreed. But you're using their morphology, or their ecology, or their behavior, or their phylogenetics to recognize them as being two different species. But that's not what makes them two different species, right? What makes them two different species is that they're reproductively isolated from one another and reproductively cohesive within their own groups. Yeah? So I, that's why I'd rather not use the word morphological species concept because that implies that what makes a species a species is some difference in morphology, but only in as much as that difference in morphology is tied to reproductive isolation and reproductive cohesion within your group. So then it goes, I argue, why would it be better to think of these as species recognition criteria? Because they can be used to recognize species, but they don't define what a species is. Yeah? And then why might it be, con what might be considered the universal species concept, or which might be, probably mostly if you had to pick between these four, the biological species concept, or you could say the universal species concept really has to be tied to something about reproductive cohesion and reproductive isolation between species. Yeah? How is a species concept different from species recognition criteria? Species concept is what is a species, what makes a species a species. Recognition criteria is just how do you know a species when you see it, right? You can all recognize a dog from a cat. It doesn't have anything to do with your concept of what makes a species a species, what makes a dog one species and a cat another species. Yeah. You realize this is incredibly esoteric, esoteric and subtle, right? But it's important to me, because I spent like five years working on this and fighting with people about it. So you, if you were taking this course from anybody else, they probably would never ask a question like that. But you all follow what I'm saying, right? I used to fight with people who would say, oh, well, I know these two birds are different species because this one's blue and this one's turquoise. And I'd be like, so how do you know they're two different species? And they'd be like, because this one's blue and this one's turquoise. And I'm an expert on this group, and that makes them two different species. And what I wanted them to say was, well, presumably that difference in color pattern means that they're reproductively isolated from one another. I wanted them to tie it back to some sort of a universal concept for what constitutes a species and not just tell me that it's because they're an expert on this group and the color means mean something. Right? Presumably that color is indicative of some larger, more important concept, which is this idea of reproductive cohesion and isolation between groups. Yeah? Cohesion within a group, isolation between groups. Okay, how's that? I like that question. Imagine you don't. Okay. Next. Um, chapter, oh, not chapter two. Um, test two, uh, test question two. three. Real test two? Yeah, real. Question. Question. Oh, three. Three. Okay, so my toast my. Okay, so imagine you look to edit a general biology text and you turn to the glossary and notice the following definition mitosis, nuclear division used for growth and development, meiosis, nuclear division resulting in haplogametes. What do you think of these definitions? So a lot of you go, oh, that's pretty good to me, right? <laughs> that's not really what I want you to say. Are they good general definitions? The answer is not really. And what the easiest way to sum up what's really kind of wrong with these definitions is that they are true. They're absolutely true, but only for animals. So if you're never ever going to look at any other living thing and you're only going to deal with animals, that's true. Meiosis always results in haploid gametes. There is no example in any animal of meiosis making anything else. Animals don't have spores. Did you notice that? Did you notice when we started talking about animals, I didn't call anything a spore? Yeah, I talked an awful lot about spores up till then. 
right? There are no animal spores, right? Most other things actually do meiosis to make spores. All plants do, for example. No plant would ever do meiosis to make gametes. They all use meiosis to make spores. Fungi typically use meiosis to make spores. Um, I'm not sure you could really, there's lots of mitotic spores in fungi too, but I don't think there's anything in a fungus that's produced by meiosis that's not called a spore, right? Yeah, and in most of the algae, macroalgae, they have a plant-like history, they do meiosis to make spores too. So this business about meiosis makes gametes, that's, that's an animal thing. Animals are the weirdos, not everybody else, right? Everybody else is doing it normal, using meiosis to make spores. Animals are weird in that they make gametes. And mitosis, it says it's used for growth and development. Well, again, that's true for animals. But if you go to fungi, there's lots of mitosis that makes spores or conidia. Uh, in plants, you can have um, mitosis making gametes. In fact, all gametes in plants are made through mitosis. So that's kind of one. So why are these definitions not adequate? Why are they potentially confusing? It's because they're, it goes back to they're only true for animals. I mean, kind of ideally, I'd like you to say something like meiosis in all plants and in anything with a plant life history and in fungi make spores. They don't make gametes. So that's just simply wrong, yeah. It's just not a, a general enough definition. Instead, remember the definitions I'd like you to use for mitosis and meiosis that are always true, is that mitosis is a nuclear division that doesn't reduce the chromosome number. So you're going either from diploid to diploid or haploid to haploid. And meiosis, there's always a chromosomal reduction. So you're always starting with a diploid nucleus and going to haploid nuclei. That definition will never get you into trouble. But this business about what the cells are that result from that type of a nuclear division, that's going to be really variable across different taxonomic groups, so it's very hard to make some generalized statement about that. Yeah? Did y'all come up with a nice, succinct answer that would fit right here? Make sure you say somewhere in your answer, these definitions are for animals. They're not general definitions. They're animals only. Yeah? Okay. Are we happy with that? No? Okay, next. We have about half hour left. What do you want can we do number all of oh, number four and all of them? Number four on this one? Mm -hmm. All of them. <laughs> number four on all the exams? Oh, yeah. <laughs> number four no, on no, that one. That one. <laughs> okay. So, stomatal piles and algorithms are two newly recognized eukaryotic lineages. A few years ago, biologists would not have thought to use these particular groupings. Why not? Okay, so maybe let's bring up the picture for this. Okay, so these are the alveolates, and these are the staminopiles, right? They're both in the supergroup, uh, in Campbell at least, called chrome alveolata. So if you look, it says, why would we have not thought to put these guys together? Well, dinoflagellates used to be classified within the protista as being algae. Apicomplexans would have been classified as being protozoans. Ciliates would have been classified as being protozoans, right? So we've got a mixture of algae and protozoans in here. How about over here? Diatoms would have been classified as algae. Golden algae is algae. Brown algae is algae. And oomycetes would have been classified as what? Fungal-like protists, right? So that's like fuzzy stuff on this bit. Remember saprolagnia? Y'all remember saprolagnia? That's like a distance memory now. <laughs> So again, you have a mixture of algae and non-algal protists here. You have protozoans and algae mixed together. So that's the answer. It says, a few years ago, biologists would not have thought to use these groups. Why? Because they mix together. They're, they're mixtures of algae and protozoans and fungal-like protists, right? They would have been more likely to put all the algae together, all the protozoans together. You realize algae and protozoans are not real groups, right? But that's what they would have been inclined to do. Talk about the algae, talk about the protozoan, talk about the fungal-like protists. But here, we now have groups, a single group called alveolus, which is a mixture of algae and protozoans. And over here, we have a mixture of algae and fungal-like protists. 
in the sliding here that shows this better. A vertical slide. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's not this one, though. That's going to frustrate me now. Because now the more I'm remembering it, it really here it is. Sorry, I had the wrong one. Right? This shows it well. The alveolates, you have ciliates, happy complexes, which would have been protozoans, right? And then you also have these guys, which would have been algae. And within the this group, the stromenopile, right? You have the fungal like protein. And then you also have these algal groups. Yeah? That's showing it better. Right? That's what I wanted to show. And then notice over here within this group that we were calling rhizaria, you also have a mixture of what would have been considered algae and things that would have been considered like protozoans. So notice that you've got algae and protozoans and <coughs> uh, fungal like protozoans scattered across there, right? They're not all, it's not like everybody here is orange and everybody here is green and everybody here is blue or something. That's the way they would have historically classified them. So why not? It's because it's a mixture of, of these groups that were historically recognized, these three. How about what morphological evidence indicates that these two groups, alveolates and stromenopiles, might be good monophyletic groups? Alveoli. Remember what those are? They're the little air sacs that are underneath the cell membranes in these guys. And Remember, all of the stromenophiles have at some point in their life history a cell with two laterally attached flagelli, one that's smooth and one that has tripartite pencil hairs on it, that hairy flagellum. It's unique to them. So it really doesn't matter whether you have a diatom or brown alga or fuzzy stuff on dead fish. They all have these hairy flagella at some point on a cell in their life history. That, these would be two good morphological indicators that those are actually good. So that's the answer. Yeah. I don't have to 